everybody. It's time again for HR questions. And my name is Marcia O'Connor. I am CEO and founder of the O'Connor Group. We are a 13-year-old women-based um, organization out in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. And we basically do outsource HR and outsource recruiting. So I have a lot of questions, so bear with me here. And again, if anybody needs to reach out to me personally, feel free to do that. <clears throat> M. O'Connor at TOCGRP.com. Okay, we are here for you guys today. All right, first question, Eric Blandino. Eric asks, how do I manage employees so they follow rules established by the company? And so some background here. In the past, we have experienced solicitation of other work, showing up late, misinforming client, incomplete work, et cetera. What are examples of writing an agreement for our team members that explain our boundaries and expectations of the position they applied for? <clears throat> we don't want to feel like we're just telling them to do this, but you can't do that. We would like to be positive about these expectations and also careful with what we say from an HR perspective. So, you know what, what I would do, Eric? I'm not sure if you actually have an HR handbook, but an HR handbook pretty much is like your Bible of your company. And if anything ever does happen, typically the first place um, an employment attorney is going to look is an HR handbook. And it doesn't have to be crazy. Um, you know, we do them for our clients, but to be honest with you, there are really easy templates that you can download um, that basically give you the gist of what you need. And in those, we'll basically talk about, you know, your hours and vacation and ethics and what you want to do. The thing is you want to make sure it's part of your onboarding that they review it, they sign off on it, because now they basically have said that, okay, this is how I should be acting, and you basically made it very clear to everybody and that you're consistent. So I think a lot of times, too, when we go into um, brand new companies, we find that they don't have a handbook, and so there's a lot of ambiguity um, in regards to just, like, what happens, like, bereavement, and what happens for, like, a sick day, you know, what does the policy offer, and it's the communication behind all that. I also think it's really important when someone starts to have some kind of an onboarding program, because I think it's going to get harder and harder actually to recruit um, probably in 21 and 22 with what's going on. <clears throat> We're going to come back pretty strong, I think, after the vaccines and all. So having a handbook is really going to be very helpful for you. It doesn't have to be too um, binded, but I would say make sure it's very easy to read, understood, and make sure they sign off on it so that they've actually done that. And then lead by example, too. You know, you can't basically say to do all these things if, as you as the leader isn't doing them, too. And you want to make sure that people are communicated to and listened to. And like I said, the best thing a leader can do right now is the three C's and the P. Um, caring, compassion, lots of communication, and definitely more patience now than ever. And I think that's really, really important. But that's the best thing to do. And I think when you are very clear about your expectations, you actually have your handbook on all two, and you show them what you're needing on all two, and then you do the re little rewards on all two. You have to make sure people feel acknowledged and appreciated. That is more important now than ever before. And I do have a fear right now um, for next year, once it gets warmer outside, once that confidence goes back up in regards to the vaccines, I do think people are going to really start looking for new jobs in the March and April timeframe because of that. So what I'm telling a lot of my clients now is whatever it takes, make sure that you're reaching out to your team members, you know, appreciate what's going on, let's sit together as a team, what's happening, because I think it's going to be an interesting story next year, okay? Hope that helps. Next question, Law Jackson. Law, you always give us great questions, so thanks for always being on board with us. I appreciate that. Um, I could use some help staying on course while I build up more revenue. What are some affordable ways to stay accountable with my sales and process implementation? And let me talk about his background. Thanks to eight months of mentorship, I have a basic sales process. Congratulations. A short list of vendors and a project manager in training. You have come far in eight months. I thought sales was my biggest problem. That I thought it was my limited capacity. Now I know it's my poor system of processes. I'm figuring out my process from sales through to production. It's not perfect, but it works. The real pain is removing myself from the different stages and still getting quality results. We totally understand that. 
You may remember that I'm transitioning away from freelance mode. It's still pretty much just me. I have a loose plan with a hundred little things to do each week. What are some ways to implement process, improve my ability to delegate and develop sales? Do you think an accountability group would help? Um, I always think an accountability group would always help, period. But I can tell you there is a, another good book out there by Gina Wickman called um, Traction. And Traction is basically is he's the founder of the EOS um, implementation process. Um, EOS stands for Entrepreneur Operating System. So um, we started using that back in 2016. And um, I didn't have as big a team as I do today. But what it did help me is write everything down in front of me to see where I was basically wearing three or four hats, if not more, at that time. Now, if you say that you already have basically a project manager in training and all, that's phenomenal. You also have to think about one of the things I think people forget about is outsourcing like an executive assistant, you know, virtual assistants right now. They, they too are very helpful so that you can focus on what you do best. I think one of the biggest things as an entrepreneur is that trust factor and when to let go. But if you really want to build it and grow it, there are certain things that you're going to be, have to be very comfortable with letting go so that you can focus on what you do best at. And when I actually wrote down an accountability chart, basically it's an organizational chart. And you want to go through all the different things like your finance, your marketing, your sales, your operations and all. And once we did that, I was actually wearing like four hats. And in order to grow to where I wanted to go with the number that I wanted to do, I knew that um, I had a gave, I gave myself a timeline of when I would actually start hiring somebody like that. But as you know, you can't hire until you have more sales and that process moving. So you have sometimes to look into like 1099 subcontractors to help you out right now too. So that's what I did for my very first three years. So I only used 1099 people to help me out to get where I needed. And then when revenue started coming in, I would put that revenue back into the company to basically I then start paying payroll. But I needed certain things to help me get started, like a payroll company. It was really important that I knew all those forms and documentation would be getting done the proper way. So I outsourced that immediately. And about after three years, I finally hired an outsourced bookkeeper to help me with, the, the, um, with my QuickBooks at that time. Uh, I thought I knew it all. I was a former accountant. And ironically, when she took over, I didn't know it all. Um, and it was actually, she still manages my stuff today. And she manages actually all my invoices and all my reconciliations. Um, she, and she's also a techie. So all my stuff is now on processes and all my systems and all. But the first three to five years, obviously, it was primarily mostly me. And then I had a lot of contractors. I didn't hire my first full-time person, a W-2, until like three years later. But how you want to do that? is honestly, I have a vision board and I start just writing down basically what's most important, how am I using my time, you know, who can I basically use at the 1099 to help me get where I need to go. A virtual assistant is probably one of the best things you'll ever invest into. I was, I didn't start one and probably until about two years ago, <clears throat> bad move. I should have done that like 10 years ago. And I really feel as if that person could have taken off a lot off my plate. Because as an entrepreneur, you don't think anybody else can do it better than you. That's just that's how our DNA is set. So I would definitely make sure that you're writing stuff down, figuring out what you control, what you can control, where the revenue is coming from, saving up to make sure that you can pay certain things and all too. Um, you just don't. You want to make sure that you have a good cash flow going on there too. I mean, people I know live on like lines of credits and all. I get all that. Just keep that in mind. You have to pay it back. So you want to make sure that you're, you're writing things out, you have a timeline. And what I used to do is I actually used to have on my vision board um, the revenues every year that I knew that I wanted to make. And I started writing that down and I still have in my original office in my, my basement actually has that board that has every year of what those revenues that I wanted to see. And then at year end, I either check it off, I erase it, or I put a bigger number on there too. So by seeing that and looking at that constantly, it really helps you keep that focus. And then have a peer group too. That peer group basically of other entrepreneurs that are going to help you stay accountable too. And because every time you come to those meetings, they should basically be going over everything that you're doing. Um, I actually belong to um, obviously AO as well. I belong to EO. I belong to CEO Think Tank, which is a unique group out here in Philadelphia. 
But I think because um, when you're done those meetings, you actually write down those accountability of what you say you're going to do. And you want to make sure that you do do them because obviously we're all triple A personalities. Um, and it's not a good thing to show up without basically having that stuff done. But I know that's a long-winded answer there for you. I hope that helps. But I would say definitely write stuff down about what's important and what's not. I, start, I didn't actually, um, my processes got much more defined probably about five years into the company because we were, we were constantly just changing. And I realized that the biggest thing for me was, honestly, was, was you know, bringing in revenue so that I could start, start paying people and getting things moving in W-2. And now I had employer taxes and all, too. But the biggest thing for me was just make it simple. Don't co overcomplicate the process and all, too. Because um, you will eventually, but right now just make it simple, okay? Um, Bob Gawari. I'm probably butchering that one. Uh, Gagir? Gagir? I'm horrible at last name, so I apologize for that, Bob. But you've asked, how do you know when to call it quits on a business idea? And your background, over the past decade, I've launched five or six businesses, set up e-commerce sites, obtained sales, and then stopped when I didn't believe I could turn a profit. Now, with my current venture, I'm in the same spot, and I'm not sure if I should push forward or switch gears to one of my other entrepreneurial ideas. Now, I have a few questions already on this. Because you said you've launched five or six businesses, set up e-commerce sites, obtained sales, and then you stop it. Number one, that is a lot of work to do, and then to go through all of that, and then to stop because something's not missing. Well, I, I wonder if you can actually focus on, there are a lot of colleges in the area that have really good entrepreneurial programs, and they do a lot of um, nonprofit uh, pro bono work for individuals like you. And I would say you have all these ideas. It's just that little kink in there of basically how can I get it out there so I can start making money on it. And I think maybe if you could reach out to them because it's, it's free um, and just um, see whether or not they could help you put that plan together to actually put a revenue forecasting model in there and how to obtain that. Because if you've done it five or six times, there's definitely there's a missing link in there that you probably just need a little counseling on and a little coaching on. And I'm hoping that you're up for it and all too, but you don't have to spend a ton of money on this. There are, like I said, there's so many wonder, like I live outside of Philadelphia and um, University of Penn has a great program. Westchester has a great program. Drexel has a program. Temple has a program. And you just have to reach out to see whether or not they could help. But I would say try to go to a peer group of other entrepreneurs and see who they are using for that um, opportunity. But you really want it. There's a missing kink in there because you probably have these wonderful ideas, and they probably can make more money than you could imagine. It's just something that you haven't been coached in yet. And so my biggest fear is that you're starting again, um, and then going down that same pike if you have that um, background already. So reach out to those resources. I can help you with that. And just you need to get over that hump. And I think once you get over that hump, I would actually go back to those five or six businesses and see whether or not. Um, you can bring any of those back to life because you probably had a great idea. You just didn't know how to get over that hump. So that's, that's what I would do. When I first started, I used to do a lot of um, just my own set of entrepreneurs and peer groups with them and talking to them and, and hearing things. I did join Vistage, their trusted advisor group, when I first got started. I didn't know how I was going to afford it per month because, you know, I wasn't bringing a lot of revenue. And so it, it was expensive, I thought, for me. And, but I did get a lot out of it. I just felt like it got me on my path of hearing what other people were doing and how they were getting there. And then I felt as if there was a point in there that I felt like I bypassed them. It was because of the fact that I was bringing on more people. My sales were increasing. Things were happening. And then every month we met, you had this, like, you know, green, red, yellow, green light um, chart that you had to fill out. And I kept getting greens on there. And my counterparts were getting more like yellow and red, yellow and red. So it was something that uh, we were doing in regards to just pushing out there, getting things moving, um, and then just letting a lot of people help us out with that. I also think, too, when people start a business, what they don't do enough of is use, I call the mini marketers. And these are people that you surround yourself with that would love to hear what you are doing. And they're really into it and they're excited for you. But what they do is they meet a lot of people, too. They sell they start help you sell your business without 
them even knowing you. And that's why I call them mini marketers. So get yourself surrounded with connectors who are going to help you basically get your product out there and all too. But definitely target the colleges in the area that have these entrepreneur programs and all too. And especially right now, because they're looking for a lot of visibility, they're willing to help um, a lot of entrepreneurs. And get ready, guys. I think entrepreneurism is going to explode um, in the next like, you know, two or three years as well because people have been home. And now they're working on a lot of ideas that are happening out there, too. So I hope that, I hope that answers your question. Okay, the next one is from um, Mary um, Rentacalio. Um, I just never get like John Smith. Um, so how do I determine how to pay someone to do work for me? Business, uh, I have a therapy machine for horses and have found an, a person to hire to use it. What would be my best salary alternative, hourly paid or per treatment? One treatment is 30 minutes and minimum charge is $50. The person knows a lot of people and is located in a training center for horses, and there is a demand right away. I'm a vet currently working with small animals as a contractor. Honestly, um, you know, hourly or per treatment kind of a deal. Um, you, you already said it, basically. Um, one treatment is 30 minutes, and minimum charge is 50. Honestly, I like doing hourly because I think as if you can control it a little bit better, and they have that flexibility, too. Um, but you want to make sure that there is accountability there too. When you have a W-2 person, which is an employee, and then you have a 1099, which is a contractor and all too, you just want to make sure with that 1099 that there is an agreement between the two of you, um, that you there is a written document out there that you can use for a 1099 agreement too. Because as a 1099, they're also telling you that they're going to be paying taxes quarterly uh, because as a W-2, you pay those employer taxes as a 1099, you do not. You just give them a check, basically, that they say that they're paying those taxes. You got to be careful about that, too, depending how long that they work with you. And if they're basically doing a lot of work for you, the same kind of work for a long period of time, it's to your uh, benefit to put them to a W-2 employee instead of a 1099. But I do know there are several people that I know that have successful companies that have a lot of 1099s. The problem with that is if the Department of Labor, DOL, comes in and reviews your payroll accounts and sees these people here a long time, they could basically fine you for back taxes in regards to not paying employer taxes, you know, like um, the Medicaid and um, all these other, just a bunch of taxes that get a, a part of that. But I would do it hourly. I would have an agreement in there. I would put in there how many um, potential hours per week you're looking for, you know, because if you know that it takes 30 minutes and all to you and what that charges, you want to make sure, and I'm not sure if that person knows how much that charges and all to you, but you want to set it up so that, you know, you can rely on them, have a decent wage, and also make sure you're having a profit in there too. And when you do a profit, you want to make sure like there's a multiplier in there. So say, for example, um, you know, uh, fifty dollars um, a half an hour, and how much of that do you want? But also, you got to make sure if you're going to pay that person, that they feel as if like it was worth it, it's worth their time, and they're going to come back and that they're loyal to you. So I would be very cautious about that and put some numbers in place and all too. But don't be just figuring like minimum wage and all too. You want to keep these people because the last thing you want if you have good clientele. And then you have a lot of turnover because people get very comfortable, especially with treatments. They get very close to these people. You want to make sure that you have a really good hourly wage for your 1099s. Just make sure you have agreements in place and you have them someplace where they sign off on that too because you want to make sure that you are protected in the long run as well. Okay? Very important. Um, next question is from Zach Williams. Zach asks, how can we differentiate ourselves and build a moat in a saturated market? And his background is, we sell houseplants online and provide a wealth of plant care tips and information. We were a fairly early mover in the trend, but the market is saturating and competition is increasing, and therefore the cost of a new customer is increasing. We have been focusing on producing content, increasing our returning customer rate, and lowering our prices. But we are looking for some other ways to build a moat and differentiate ourselves in the market. Well. Honestly, I think wonderful idea that you're doing plants. I'm a big believer in plants myself. I can only imagine that the market has exploded because of everybody being at home. And not only that, but pur purification of the um, 
of your offices as well as the bedrooms and all too. So I think that's wonderful. And you know what? Don't be like everybody else. And I, I would say the way to do that is to think about if you're that plant owner and all too, I think it's all about education right now. And I don't think a lot of the average consumer understands like the value of having plants. So why don't you do something like, did you know? And do like these did you know episodes and all too on your on your um, your page and to get the word out about, you know, not just because of buying plants are good, but did you know basically it provides people um, happiness. And did you know, um, you know, having like small trees and all too and the, the importance of your mental well-being and wealth, mental wellness is going to be humongous. And honestly, I would actually target your stuff into companies that are doing onboarding programs and these onboarding packages to new employees and having a plant part of that, I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, I think it's because of the fact that so many people are starting their jobs and going re remote and, and being at home and to have a package of stuff to say, hey, um, you know, here's a plant for you. So rethink how you're thinking like everybody else and you want to be a little bit different. And the more that you educate your people out there about the the, the properties behind the plant and no, hey, this is a new way of thinking about plants, everybody. Instead of a birthday cake, you know, send a plant and instead have like plant birthday cakes or something like that and, and really juice it up because I feel as if um, plants are, are just one of the best things that you can do right now. Now, not everybody is a green thumb and you talk about that too. Oh, so I heard you're not a green thumb. Well, let me tell you how to fix that, you know, and these different things that you could purchase so that it waters itself. I mean, there's all these really cool things you could do about that. I would also like work with like, you know, um, these furniture companies right now are putting together these uh, like furniture in a box. So when someone starts at home, they're going to get a chair, they're going to get, you know, um, the workstation, they're going to get all these new things, um, the light and all. And I don't see why you would say, hey, how about we work together here and I'll provide a plan as part of your package. So it's stuff like that. Just start thinking outside the box of like why it's so important to have plants. And I think the more you do that, the better. I actually have a client that is a, um, they make teas and their teas are amazing. Number one, their website is amazing. Number two, they have like the coolest recipes on their website. And most of the time I refer that website out to a lot of my friends who like to cook. And, and you know what, guess what? A lot of more tea drinkers. So they look at that and, and use that as like a really cool, healthy cookbook for themselves. But then it also gives them that advertisement for their teas. And excuse me, they're based out in Oregon. They do a wonderful job. But it was just a different way of thinking about your, your, your stuff. And I think, um, you know, all the ways to like, like you know, working with, um, you know, motivating your people. Like right now, engagement for employees is going to be very difficult next year. We're going into a third wave of COVID. And I would suggest just ways to like, be empowering your employees and all too. Hey, I'm thinking of you today. Um, so work, reach out to your benefit providers. Reach out to basically um, employers who have a lot of new hires and, and propose your idea of like, hey, we have a plant in the box idea. And this is what it is. It's like you have a new person and basically we, we provide them a plant. And, or maybe do plants and personalities. And you know what kind of personality you have and this is the kind of plant that matches that personality. It, it's, it sounds corny. But you know what? Right now, there is so much people, there's so much worry for employer side of the house of the well-being of the employee right now. I would say take advantage of that opportunity and really target something like that too because there's so much you can do with plants. But yet again, I am a, I'm a gardener, so I love plants. Um, and uh, I think it's a, I haven't seen anything out here on the East Coast about using plants as an employee engagement and all, and I think it's a wonderful idea. So that's how you think differently and think of how someone would use a plant and we're at and all too. And even I'm sure you probably sell succulents and all too. That's like the hot rage right now too. Um, you know, just, I would say be different and think about the employee wellness. Think about how to be different, educate them and all too. Like a, did you know, have like, you know, fun little things because we're at our computers all day. Like, Hey, pop up today, like today only, like, let us know. Did you know this or this and this, whoever answers gets a free plant. Something like that, that's going to make you different, okay? And that's basically setting up that community out there of individuals. And you'd be surprised of how many people are so eager to be a part of something that makes them feel good and they feel as if they're, they're giving back to the community. So I hope that helps you.
So that's what I would do. And let me see. Adam Drake. Okay. Adam, why isn't my phone ringing off the hook if I show up on Google several times on first page for my relevant search terms? I own a registered investment advisory firm. The two towns we are have we are in we have populations 15,000 to 20,000 people. Could it just be that we are in small markets? Yes, we do get leads off web search, but most of our leads come from word of mouth, the next door, and referrals. For, for, for financial firms like ours, should I be concerned with number of leads from web, or should we focus more on outbound sales strategies in your opinion? So, totally get it. And sales has changed considerably. And the idea behind that, uh, we came up with uh, when this all happened, you know, we felt most of the time, most of our work was basically meeting people and word of mouth, right? And so this has changed everything. And so we came up basically with these learning series that we do for our clients now. We do one for CEOs. We do one for senior HR people. We do one for senior recruiting people. We do um, 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 HR office hours and on out too. We start doing all these learning initiatives and what has happened with that is we we have a following now of individuals who always come to them, who always ask questions. And guess what? Once we put our stuff onto our website, they are referring it out to their colleagues as well. But you always have to be teaching them something because they just want to learn and grab onto all that. And if you're an investment firm, with all the changes that are going on with this new administration, I would say just get out front and be that SME, subject matter expert out there. It could be a LinkedIn update. It could be basically small videos. Hey, guys. Hey, it's Tom here. You know, I just want to give you the top three things of the week to think about. Boom, boom, boom. They get to know you. It gets forwarded out there. I mean, use LinkedIn to your biggest advantage. I know you're putting in Google and you think this stuff is going to work for you. Unfortunately, what I think you have to do is you have to do most of the work. And you don't have to work as hard as you think. LinkedIn is like a wonderful free tool out there that I don't think people use enough in regards to their marketing purposes. And I think if you start doing these, um, these forums and all too, and they don't take a lot, you can do a, a Zoom, you can do Microsoft Teams, you can do a Google Hangout and all too, but you actually have to bring in like presenters and speakers and all too. And if you do them once a month, you get a following, you get people referring, it takes a little bit of time. It might take two or three months before you start seeing business come around, but what you want to do is grow that group so it gets larger and larger and all too. Because I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just, you know, the, I always tell people, um, you know, how did I get started? I pick up the phone and, and I still do that. So even with my current clients, I check in with them probably at least once a month, all of them, because uh, we have a lot of them now, but it's more along the lines like, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? What are you hearing out there? What's happening? And when you start hearing things that they're keeping up at night, you write that stuff down and then you start putting programs together to basically answer those questions. Because you better believe it, once you start sending that information out to them, they're going to listen to it and they're going to refer it to other people. And then all of a sudden, you become that subject matter expert and they basically people are going to you because you know so much about it. And you know what? I had one this morning. Um, I call it HR um, Access. And the biggest thing right now for all my HR friends is the retirement plans are going to change a lot next year. And so I had a specialist come on board to talk about, hey, what does that look like for next year? And tell us more about it. And she was great. And they, they asked her a lot of questions and all too. And so our next one is the same time next month and all too. But, you know, because I do so much follow up, because the fact that it happens, we get work out of that left and right. And, um, you know, the idea behind it wasn't so much work. It was more just helping them out and be visible. But I think if you start doing these things, it'll really, really help you get a lot more business than you can ever imagine. Um, but you're just, you're doing the right thing. And um, it takes a little bit of time, plan it out like a marketing strategy kind of a deal. And if you need any, any help at all, like I said before, reach out to me. I'm glad to help whatever you guys need, okay? Um, that is my last um, question of the day. What I do want to suggest, though, just to let you know, uh, we just sent out on our um, newsletter about um, just connecting with people. And um, the holidays are coming up. It's already sometimes a sad time for a lot of people. 
a lot of people are sick right now and all too um, from my HR hat is reach out to three people a week um, that you haven't talked to in a while and you don't know where that conversation is going to go but the fact that you've done that will actually mean more to them than you can ever imagine right now and we're supposedly going into a third wave right now of, of COVID unfortunately so January and February are going to be really tough months especially if it gets really cold and it's dark and all too and you know just just do it do me a favor just three people a week just reach out to whether it be family friends co-workers and all too and just say hey how you doing um, I think it'll go a really long way not only for them but also for you because um, they're going to be very happy to hear from you you're going to check in on mental well-being and not only that it's probably the right thing to do but the main thing when you do that good karma out there and that good karma comes back and I saw Sean putting something out there about um, uh, pretty much like the secret uh, about positive attraction I totally believe that and when my company first started um, I thought people were like you know listen to the secret and I'm like yeah 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 oh, I listened to the secret I had the CDs in my car I must have listened to that over a hundred times and Sounds really crazy, but I would say to myself, I need four checks in the mail today. I need four checks on Friday. I need that for payroll. I need that for payroll. And guys, I would get four checks in the mail. And I am telling you, when you ask that universe for that help and that extra, it is amazing. But as long as you are open for it, because um, success is amazing, it's hard. Um, but I also know it's there if you want it. You got to basically not have that barrier. Oh, this summer going to happen. Well, then if you think that, you're right. It won't. But if you think more like, I need, I want this. This is where we're going, and I'm going to get this. You know, and in the mail, I'm going to get those four checks. You, you really will. So if you do anything this weekend, definitely just download a video from that um, to get your mindset in there and all too, and being positive because it really does pay off. And I've been in business for 13 years now. I'm almost. I have 38 employees, and I would not have gotten here without my little village of helpers and my positive people and the secret and the book, The Alchemist, um, because I really believe that those, those things all tied me to where I'm at today. And, you know, and I, I love what I do. So I'm here to help you out, whatever you guys need to. HR can be fun. doesn't have to be painful. You just want to make sure that you have certain things in place and all, too, to make sure that you don't have any pain down the road. Um, and we're here to help anytime. Again, I'm Marcia O'Connor. Have a great holiday season. Stay well. And again, if you want to reach out to me, M. O'Connor at TOCGRP. And uh, peace out, people. Take care.